<laughs> All right, that's where we'll start. Where did you get that laugh? Uh, my laugh is something that I have had since I was the tiniest uh, child. There was a time when my brother and sister would not go see a movie with me because it was too <laughs> damn embarrassing. Uh, so anyway, it's there and... And uh, do you ever deploy it intentionally or is it only unintentional? No, believe it or not, it, uh, it's very frequent. I would make like a great Ed McMahon. I could be somebody's sidekick, you know, sit there on the sofa and just laugh at all their jokes <laughs> and it would be very genuine. I, I turn out to be easily amused. <laughs> That's good. Um, so as number one on the list, we were talking to Steve Case yesterday and he had been number one. And a couple of years later, he was not on the list. Well, what you're making me really nervous. No, now. no, no, don't be nervous. Just tell me what could happen that would do that to you and Amazon, and how do you prevent that? Do you worry it could all come unraveled? Well, I kind of have this, this experience kind of already happened to me because uh, you put me on the cover of Time Magazine as Person of the Year in 1999, and about a year later, the internet bubble burst. I think Amazon stock went from $113 a share to six or something like that. So these you things know, happen. When the thing for companies is you need to be um, if you, uh, nimble and robust. So you need to be able to take a punch uh, and you also need to be quick and, 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 and innovative and, and doing new things at a high speed. That's, that's the best defense against the future. And you have to always be leaning into the future. If you're if you're leaning away from the future, the future is going to win every time. Never, ever, ever lean away from the future. You talked, though, about 1999 and the um, <clears throat> person of the year. When Jim Kelly and myself and others at time chose you as person of the year, I remember the Internet bubble was beginning to look like it might burst that November of 1999. Yeah. I went up to uh, Don Logan, who was then the president of Time, Inc., somebody you know, above us all, and I said, look, I'm a little bit worried. We're about to do Jeff Bezos. It's an Internet company. Yeah. You know, tell me what you think. And he said, Jeff Bezos is not in the Internet business. He's in the customer service yeah. business. That's right. You don't have to worry. Yeah. Um, how did you get that focus on customer service rather than on being an Internet company? I don't know. I think um, we have always had, and it's been from the very, very beginning, you can go back and read our 1997 shareholder letter, uh, and the, the core of the company is customer obsession as opposed to competitor obsession. And that works really well for us. It's a, uh, I think that the advantage of being customer focused is that customers are always dissatisfied. They always want more. And so they pull you along. If you're trying to serve them, they pull you along. Um, whereas if you're competitor obsessed, if you're a leader, if you're the leader, you know, you can kind of look around and you see everybody running behind you. Maybe you slow down a little. And customers are always pulling you. Uh, so I think if you want to be pioneering, if you want to be inventive, uh, if you want a culture that is experimental, then you want to be customer obsessed rather than competitor obsessed. Now, how does something like Alexa, the Amazon yeah. Echo, fit into being customer obsessed? Well, it's about definitely about leaning into the future. Um, and so... Uh, when you look at the kinds of things that you want to be able to do with your voice, uh, you know, it, it changes for, for those of you who have used an Echo, the fact that it's always on, uh, that you never have to charge it, it's always sitting there ready in your kitchen or your bedroom or wherever you put it, the fact that you can talk to it in, uh, in a natural way removes a lot of barriers, a lot of friction, a lot of like little tiny uh, pieces of friction to be able to do things, to ask what the weather is. It's easier than taking your phone out of your pocket. Mm -hmm. And what, what, has, what people have found over and over again is that by removing the tiniest amounts of friction from ordinary activities, really people appreciate that and, and it improves customers' lives. And does it learn? Yeah. No, it's always learning. You know, the brains of Alexa are in the cloud. They're not on that little device. So that's why the device is actually, uh, as a physical device, relatively simple. It's a speaker. It has seven microphones. It has enough digital signal processing power on board to be able to do beam forming, find your voice, uh, acknowledge the wake word. The wake word is the Alexa. Uh, and then it starts listening, and then it sends that phrase to the cloud where we can do really in compute intensive processing on it. Wait, wait. Here's a real paranoid question because you just said yeah. Alexa is the wake word. Does it listen if I don't say Alexa? No. 
and it, it listens just for that word, and that's why we do the wake word detection locally on board the device. So if I talk about toothpaste a lot, but haven't said Alexa, it's not like Amazon's learning that I'm interested no, in toothpaste. No, not at all. And in fact, you know, the, uh, you guys should, you know, we, we, one of the great issues of our age is going to be privacy. Uh, and, uh, you know, people don't think about it, but if you have a mobile phone in your pocket, it has microphones on it, and those microphones are under software control, and I would posit to you that just about any nation state in the world worth its salt can put a computer virus on your phone anytime they want and listen to everything you say from your cell phone. And how do you prevent that from happening to Echo? Meaning, Well, we've done something a little unusual with Echo um, because we were thinking about that very thing. And we, uh, first of all, we know different from your phone, but we actually went one step further than what's done on a phone. When you hit the mute button on Echo, that red ring comes on that says that the microphone is turned off. That mute button is connected to the microphone with analog electronics. Oh. So it actually cannot be routed. You can't, you'd have to come physically tamper with the device. Mm -hmm. You couldn't do it with a computer virus. And so um, it learns, and that got you into the artificial intelligence world, machine learning world, so that you could uh, we've take been the in, cloud computing. And we've been in the machine learning world for a long time. Um, you know, the uh, machine learning, you know, is, I think we're, it's one of the things. We live in a very interesting time because there are a few golden ages happening. And one of them is machine learning, uh, you know, it's kind of specialized AI, and it's, uh, you can, we're doing everything with it. We're grading strawberries with it, um, you know, for Amazon Fresh. We, we, cameras look at the strawberries, and we can now outperform humans mm -hmm. on strawberry grading. So, like, that's just, I gave you that tiny example to show you that artificial intelligence and machine vision and natural language understanding, these kinds of amazing things that just 10 years ago were science fiction, are going to be very helpful in ev everywhere. You bought the Washington Post, and at least the myth is you did it almost on a handshake without a whole lot of That's diligence. Not a, that is not a myth. I did zero due diligence. Oh. I did not negotiate. I um, accepted the That's asking. I'd love to sell you. I accepted the asking price. Yeah. I, it wouldn't have happened that way. It couldn't have happened that way, except for the person that I was dealing with was Don Graham, who I've known for 15 years and who is the most honorable uh, person uh, in the world. And so... You know, we had several conversations, and he laid out every single wart and every single uh, thing that was great about the post. And uh, the only thing I would say, and no due diligence would have ever uncovered the things that Don just told me, number one. And number two, uh, I've owned the paper for a couple of years now, and if anything... Uh, you know, the, the, the warts are not as bad as he made them out to be, and the, uh, the, the, the things that are great about the post are stronger than he made them out to be. So uh, how could I have ever have duplicated that with some kind of due diligence process? And you've, over the past two years, talked about an emerging view of what a business model could be. Give me some of the thoughts of what a business model for the Washington Post could be in the next five years? It, I think it's very, very simple um, what we have to do at the Post from a business point of view. First of all, what makes the Post great is not our business model. What makes the Post great is the tradition of investigative journalism and all the things that they have in the newsroom. I think the newsroom of the Post is absolutely killing it. I'm incredibly proud of that team. Marty Barron, in my opinion, is the best executive editor of any newspaper anywhere in the world. And, uh, and the Post has... They're very, the culture at the Post is very unusual because they're, they, and they have a, a, they're kind of swashbuckling, but they're like professional swashbucklers. And they, uh, which is, you don't want just swashbuckling, you know, without professionalism, swashbuckling just gets you killed. <laughs> and, but there are, they are, um, they have a, a swagger uh, that's, that is very, very uh, uh, useful and lets them, you know, uh, dig How into do you things, know that? Do things. you hang in the newsroom? It, uh, no, I don't. Well, I, occasionally I do, but I, hang would give you the wrong sense. I'm not there very often. I, I, have a, uh, I have a day job, which I love. I tap dance into Amazon. I live on the other side of the country, literally. I called Washington, D.C. the other Washington. Um, and so it's, it, it's, a, um, it's not practical for me to be there all the time. Um, but I, for example, I, I started to get a sense, a very powerful sense of it uh, when I went to uh, Ben Bradley's funeral. So 
there are there there there's a long tradition of the post of this of 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 just putting a lot of shoe leather into things and 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 finding stories that nobody else can find, and the post is very lucky because it is physically located in the capital city of the most important country in the world, and uh, as a result, they have lots of contacts and lots of opportunities because of that physical location. And you basically tied the New York Times yeah. on digital and perhaps with your uh, tape of uh, Donald Trump and Billy Bush, that's probably not counted in yet, that'll take you way ahead of the New York yeah, Times. Yeah. How do you monetize that? The politics team, the Post is just doing a great job this year and, and uh, I'm super proud of them. The, um, here's what, bit from, back to the business question. Um, and I don't know that this approach is accessible to all newspapers, but I'm very confident it is an approach that will work for the Post. What we need to do is we need to move from making a relatively large amount of money per reader mm -hmm. on a relatively small number of readers. Mm -hmm. That was the traditional post model for decades. Right. Very successful model, by the way. Um, uh, and we need to move from that to a model where we make a very small amount of money per reader on a much, much larger number of readers. Does and that so, uh, require micro payments or small payments? I don't think so. I think we can do it with an, a combination of a subscription model and an ad model. We'll see. But, but why would be open you do to small micro payments? payments. I, I'd be very interested I mean, in the, the, in the I, Amazon I, world too. I don't you would see want it. evidence yet, but these things can change. I don't see evidence yet that consumers are amenable to those kinds of micro payments, but uh, but we've seen this change. You know, in the early days of music subscription service, mm -hmm. consumers were not amenable to music subscriptions. They didn't want that. They wanted to buy music a la carte. Today, that's flipped around. And so uh, habits and behaviors and patterns of consumers do change slowly over time. And maybe one day they will pay by the drink Amazon for articles. And you keep Amazon and the Post separate. Yeah. But in your mind, there would be a connection between all right, we should enable really frictionless 10, 15, 20 cent payments. That could be done through Amazon, also through the Washington yeah. Post. Yeah. Do you ever see a world in which we're going to have those type of, let me buy the paper today for 10 cents as opposed to subscribe? I, I, again, I think you know, it's possible. I'm, I'm currently a little skeptical about that. I think there's so much advertising supported news out there mm -hmm. that, that it's d it may be difficult to get people to pay 10 cents. Get back to the shoe leather. At the very beginning of um, this campaign, I think Bob Wood would talk yeah. a little bit about it too. You decide to throw the kitchen sink and everything to a book on Donald Trump. Um, how involved were you in that decision? Zero. That, that was, was Marty. Marty and that's Marty Barron's decision. I, don't, I do not uh, introduce myself in any way into the daily activities of the newsroom. And my view on that would be, it would be a little bit like, um, I don't know, let's say one of your children had to have a, you know, an operation on their brain. Mm -hmm. Would you go into the operating theater and tell the neurosurgeon what to do? This is a highly professionalized activity, and we have people who have decades of experience doing it. Um, and so I, I, I help or try to help at a much higher level than, uh, than, than you know, how, should we do, should we cover this story or that story or... Well, one the, person who doesn't and, know and by the that. way, Marty, has got, Marty and his team, by the way, Marty just has an awesome team. They have good taste in these matters. Right. That's really, that's, we that's lucky critical. With Marty. Incredibly lucky. And I've, again, I did not hire Marty. Marty was there already when, and again, it's one of the things that Don Graham told me was great about the paper and he was right. Same thing with Fred Hyatt, or who leads the editorial pages. Uh, Fred Ryan, who's the publisher, um, who's just a great team. Shai Lesh, who runs technology, mm -hmm. killer team. But one person who doesn't understand that you don't order up stories like that is Donald Trump. He's true, attacked you true. very, very personally. That is true. And then you've had to answer in the newsroom, or at least in discussions with Washington Post people, how do you respond to those attacks? And what do you well, think of Donald Trump for so, doing it? You know, he's done it a couple of times uh, with me. He's done it with many people. I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not uh, well, unique. Carlos I'm, not, I'm not unique by any means. But, but uh, you know, when he did it the first time, my instinct was to take it very lightly. And in, in fact, I did take it lightly. I sent a, 
what I thought was a humorous tweet um, or that had you know hashtag send Donald to space uh, yeah, hey. final thing in the hashtag and you know I have a rocket company so I you know the <laughs> the the capability is there and um, and that was my my initial uh, kind of take on this and then but the more I thought about it um, I should not, that was a mistake. I should not have taken it lightly because, it, it, you know, we live in an amazing country where one of the things that makes this country is, so as amazing as it is, is that we are allowed to criticize and scrutinize our elected leaders. And there are other countries where if you criticize the elected leader, you might go to jail or worse, you may just disappear. And uh, that, that, uh, in a, a, the appropriate thing for a presidential candidate to do is to say, I am running for the highest office in the most important country in the world. Please scrutinize me. Mm -hmm. Please scrutinize me. And that would, by the way, signal great confidence. It would be a leader thing to do. Uh, and, uh, you know, that's not what we've seen. And, and to try and chill the media um, and, uh, and, and sort of threaten retribution, retaliation, which is what he's done in a number of cases um, for, uh, for certain you know, people involved in the media, it just isn't, it isn't appropriate. We have, we have freedom of speech in this country. It's written into the Constitution. But the Constitution, in, ex except for our norms and our behaviors, the stories we tell ourselves as a nation about who we are, it's just a piece of paper. There are a bunch of nations that have written constitutions that they don't pay any attention to. People still disappear. And you think that Donald Trump has crossed the line on the norm to be dangerous? He's eroding on issues like that. He is eroding. I don't know how dangerous it is because I think the United States is incredibly robust. We have, you know, we're not a new democracy. We're very robust. But it is, you know, it is inappropriate for a presidential candidate to erode that around the edges. They should be trying to burnish it instead of erode it. And, um, and, and when you look at the pattern of things, it's not just um, going after the media and you know, uh, uh, trying to threatening retribution for people who scrutinize him. It is also um, you know, saying that uh, he uh, may not give a graceful concession speech if he loses the election. Uh, that erodes uh, the, our, our democracy around the edges. Uh, uh, you know, saying that he might lock up his opponent if he wins erodes our democracy around the edges. These aren't acceptable behaviors, in my opinion. Well, thank you. And by the way, before we move on, I want to thank you in terms of the Washington Post, which has really hit it out of the park this year when it comes to political coverage. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Even you. if Marty deserves the credit, he does. I'm going to applaud you. He does. I will accept that uh, compliment on behalf of the amazing team. I think we applauded Marty yesterday Good. on this. Well earned. That. I'm glad you did. Going back to artificial intelligence, suppose I had Alexa and Siri yep. sitting right here. Um, which one? Uh, what's the difference between the way they learn, the algorithms they use? Well, I don't know a lot about the internal uh, operations of Siri, so it's hard for me to answer that. Um, you know, uh, Alexa is, uh, uses uh, a, a technique called deep learning that a lot of the, a lot of the uh, uh, new machine learning systems are using deep learning at least as one element of what they're doing. Uh, and, and she's continuously learning uh, as she interacts with you, getting better, trying to understand um, uh, not only your speech patterns, but also the kinds of things that you're interested in. Uh, it, things as simple as music, but more complicated things too. Well, when I look at what you're doing in AI, cloud, machine learning, space, whatever, it makes it seem like you're more of a science geek than a entrepreneur, you know, just a pure entrepreneur. Uh, I'm going to play biographer for just a little bit. Um, growing up, yeah. and I know how wonderful your parents are, yes. Jackie and Mike, what was it that caught on to science? What, what gave you this uh, background? You know, I don't know. Um, you don't get to choose your passions. Your passions choose you. I uh, watched Neil Armstrong step onto the moon when I was five years old. Uh, had a huge impact on me. And um, I read, you know, hundreds of science fiction novels by the time I was 12 or 13. Uh, I always liked science and math. Uh, went to 
Princeton to study physics and to switching to computer science. But did you have a grandfather or a mother? Or oh, I had, you know, I'm, one of the, you win a lot of lotteries in life and you lose some lotteries in life. And one of the great lotteries that I won was role models. And uh, my uh, mom, who, you know, you know my parents, uh, my mom had me when she was 17 years old. Uh, she was pregnant in 1963 in Albuquerque, New Mexico, in high school, and which was not cool. Um, and, uh, and the principal tried to kick her out of school, and, and uh, my grandfather, we called him we, Pop, mm -hmm. he went to uh, bat for her and met with the principal and said, look, you, you can't kick her out of school. She's allowed to finish school. And the principal cut a deal with him. He said, well, she can stay and finish high school, but she can't have a locker and she can't do any extracurricular activities. My grandfather, being a very wise man, was like, done, that'll work. <laughs> <laughs> so it and so, you know, my dad is a, a Cuban immigrant, uh, came over as uh, part of Operation Pedro Pan right after Castro took over, two weeks in Everglades refugee camp, picked up by a Catholic mission with 15 other Cuban boys. Um, the Catholic Church took great care of, of him. And so they both had their own remarkable lives. And, uh, but they are incredibly supportive of me and my brother and sister. So that's, they have, uh, you know, they're, they're hardworking, um, they, they care about things. They're missionary, and the uh, uh, and, and they're they're supportive. I mean, my, my mom, you know, is the kind of mother who, you know, f she's like, oh, anything I do is amazing. You know, it, it's like, uh, look, he made scrambled eggs. You know, <laughs> and, and they're not dry. You know, that kind of thing. You know, uh, so but that's a great to to grow up in an environment like that is a gigantic lottery. I I to I spent all of my summers from baby age four to 16 on my grandfather's ranch in South Texas uh, and uh, learning all kinds of things that you can only learn in a rural environment. You know, rural people can be so self-resourceful that you don't, you don't necessarily, you know, call a vet or, you know, call somebody to fix the air conditioning when it breaks. You figure out how to fix it yourself, all of those things. And so it was really a great experience for me. I think my grandfather took me all those summers um, to give my mom a break because she was so young. But uh, for me, it was just and fabulous. We used to watch too. Days of Our Lives together. In the, in the hottest, my grandmother had died, and, and my grandfather was, had always watched Days of Our Lives with my grandmother, and he remained addicted to it. And, um, and so during the hottest part of the day, uh, it came on at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and we would go back to the ranch house and watch Days of Our Lives, like sands through an hourglass. So <laughs> are the days of our lives. Amazing. Uh, and uh, he also, you developed a love of space. Yeah. And even in West Texas now, not probably yeah. too far from that yeah. ranch, you've been um, quite successful in the past month or so. Yes. Uh, shooting up things. Why? Why space? Why are we, why is why it working? Doing or this? Why are we doing this? Um, so... Uh, I, first, it's important, I think, and I'll, I'll, I can tell you why. But um, what, I, what I want to achieve with Blue Origin is to build the heavy lifting infrastructure that allows for the kind of dynamic entrepreneurial explosion of thousands of companies in space that I have witnessed over the last 21 years on the Internet. So it, when I think about the founding of Amazon.com, it only could work, so it take you back to 1995, July 1995, we open our doors. And this is a 10-person company. I'm driving the packages to the post office myself. And we, had, we were sitting on a bunch of heavy lifting infrastructure. Otherwise, a tiny company could never have started Amazon.com. You couldn't do it. For example, there was already a gigantic logistics network called the U.S. Postal Service and UPS and FedEx. That would have been tens of billions, actually hundreds of billions of dollars of capital that you would have had to have laid out if you had to build a logistics network. We didn't have to do that. It existed. That heavy lifting was already done. Um, the, the, the Internet itself was sitting on top of, at that time, uh, uh, the long-distance phone network. Again, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of capital put in place for long-distance phone calls, but repurposed for the Internet. Um, payment system. There was already a payment system. We didn't have to do that. It was called the credit card, and it had been initially put in place for travelers, mm -hmm. and so on and so on. And you can go through. And what we were able to do 
is take all of that heavy lifting infra infrastructure and kind of reassemble it in a new way and do something new and inventive with it. And that's one lens through which you can view the founding of Amazon.com. In space today, that is impossible. On the internet today, you know, two kids in their dorm room can reinvent an industry. That's how, how, uh, how it could, because you don't, you, the heavy lifting infrastructure is in place for that. Today, two kids in their dorm room can't do anything interesting in space. You know, you could build a CubeSat. There's not that much interesting about CubeSats. <laughs> and the, um, it'll, it, that may change, but right now, there's just, you, you need, there, there are certain laws of physics and certain things you need size for, and th things need to be big. We need to be able to put big things in space at low cost. And so if I'm 80 years old and I can say to myself that Blue Origin did the heavy lifting you know, I'm using my Amazon winnings mm -hmm. to do a new piece of heavy lifting infrastructure, um, uh, uh, which is low cost access to space. Vehicles have to be reusable. You can't throw them away. Throw away space vehicles every time, you're never going to lower the cost. So we're trying to lower the price of admission into space so that thousands of entrepreneurs can then do amazing, surprising things. Nobody in 1995, so that much, just nobody in 95 predicted travel. Snapchat. Right. You know, it's like, I can't predict for you what amazing entrepreneurs, brilliant, amazing entrepreneurs will do in space, but I know if I give them low cost access to space, some brilliant, you know, 22 year old is gonna figure it out. It's one of those things about what companies get sustainable. It's those that provide platforms upon which others can build. If you, Amazon if does you empower it, does others, it, you. empower others to do things. So, so AWS is like that. Kindle Direct Publishing is like that. Our third-party selling business is like that. Fulfillment by Amazon is like that. Every time you figure out some way of providing tools and services that empower other people to deploy their creativity, you're really on to something. Let's turn up the lights and people come up to the mics and as they do, one final question. You got into the studio content creation business, Mon Monster by yeah. the Sea. What's the whole point of that? Well, um, uh, Manchester by the Manchester Sea. Manchester by the Sea. Yeah, um, it's, it's, uh, the, the content creation business is, we started this thing called Prime long, long time ago now, and the founding benefit of Amazon Prime membership was fast free delivery. And we started now quite a number of years ago adding uh, streaming videos to that. And we started with things like Gilligan's Island. You know, literally it was, there were 10 or 20,000 videos when we started and they were all uh, kind of reruns. Uh, and but you had days of our lives. I, hope. I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. And we did have Star Trek, okay. um, the original series. And um, so we had a few things and, 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 and people liked it. And so then we started licensing more expensive content and people liked that. And then once we got to a certain scale level, it just made sense to start to create our own content. And what it allows us to do is to participate. And this is another of what I think. I think that uh, you know, machine learning is a golden age. I think uh, space is about to enter a golden age. And I think that TV is about to enter a golden age. The, the, the uh, may already be in the middle of one. You know, uh, we can b do things uh, at Amazon Studios that a broadcast network would not be smart to do. So for example, uh, Transparent, uh, which is an amazing show created by an amazing storyteller named Jill Soloway, could never be successful on a broadcast network. It's, it, we, on a broadcast network, it, you, can, you, you can scale is important and you can be like uh, everybody's third favorite show and that will be successful. But on, on streaming services like like Amazon Prime, you really want to be somebody's favorite show. And so it allows you to go, to take more risk. It allows you to be a little gutsier. You do need people with great taste, and, you know, like, like Jill Soloway, to, so it's not just random gutsiness. You know, that won't get you anywhere. Hi. Um, so I recently joined the board of a large CPG company, and what's been interesting for me to watch is how they talk not about their e-commerce strategy, but their Amazon strategy. Uh, and that's primarily, though, a commentary about their North American business. When you get outside of North America, uh, the, the conversation changes. And so can you be as customer focused as you talk about being in a market like China or in India where you're not number one? And how do you, how do you 
think about competition in a, in a different frame than how you get to be customer obsessed in the U.S. And, and can you compare yourself to Alibaba? Do you do the same things? Uh, no, we're very, very different. Um, uh, kind of just the way we do business. So Alibaba is... Um, uh, they kind of connect people. It's uh, it's more of an advertising business. Um, we are. Uh, can we be? Let's take China and India very separately. So uh, we are winning in India very very uh, well. Um, uh, we have an amazing leader there, a guy named Amit, who has been at Amazon for 15 years and you know here in the U.S. They moved back to India four or five years ago to start Amazon India. And that team is, is doing well. They have passed Flipkart. They are the leader in India now. So that is you know, similar to Japan, Germany, uh, the UK, France. Those countries are you know, very... In China, the leader is JD. And uh, we, ha we are totally adapting our strategy in China. We cannot run our normal playbook in China. It has to be specialized and different. So we're, we're doing that. Yes. Hey, uh, Matthew and Lynn with TechCrunch. Um, so Peter Thiel, a uh, very high profile and well-known technology investor, is reportedly going to donate more than a million dollars to the Donald Trump campaign. Uh, can you lean a little closer Sorry. to the mic? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Lynn with TechCrunch. Yeah. So Peter Thiel, a very high profile and well-known technology investor, is reportedly donating more than a million dollars to the Trump campaign. What is your stance in this? And also, if you were in Mark Zuckerberg's position, what would you do? Well, look, um, Peter Thiel is a contrarian. First and foremost, he is a contrarian. And you just have to remember that contrarians are usually wrong. Can, can, <laughs> can, 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 Conventional, conventional wisdom is usually right. Now, you get big wins. Contrarians can get big wins because when a contrarian is right, that's usually a gigantic win. So I'm not against contrarians. And, and, uh, Amazon's uh, most important bets have been very counterintuitive, and people have thought they were, you know, we were very contrarian. Something like Amazon Web Services you know, it's been in the market for seven years now. We worked on it for three years behind closed doors before we launched it, so it's more than 10 years old for us. And, but when we started doing it, all the incumbents thought we were just crazy. Um, uh, and so I'm not against being a contrarian, but you just have to remember, when you're being a contrarian, you're probably going to be wrong. And um, uh, uh, as for, you know, you're asking me, like, if he were on the Amazon board, would I ask him to leave or something like that? Is that the question? Yes. I, I would not. I, my view is, even though I would have a, I would have a dramatically different opinion, um, I think that down that path of tying everything to everything lies madness. You, you, you cannot um, say, we don't want to live in a country where you can't associate with people who have uh, wildly different political opinions from yourself. I want to live in a country where I can totally disagree with somebody's politics and still work side by side with them. And so I, 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 I think it would be uh, wrong to, um, we need more of our leaders. As I've watched this election cycle, I have seen our, too many of the people uh, in there counseling anger. Yeah. You should never counsel anger. It's okay to say to people, to your constituents, I know that you're angry, but anger doesn't take you anywhere. Let's, that's a, uh, and, and so it's way too divisive to say, if you have this political opinion, you can't sit on my board. That, that doesn't make sense. We have just a couple more minutes, so last two questions here and then here. Hi, Jeff. It's Kelly Richards. Um, question about your early days when you f were first getting Amazon going. How am, I, I heard recently that you talked to 60 people or something crazy turned you down before you got that first million or something. I, I found that astounding. It was a different era. All the investors asked, what's the internet? And there, I, had, I took 60 meetings. This is 1994, early 1995. I took 60 meetings and got 22 yeses and raised a million dollars, $50,000 at a time. Wow. And uh, they got 20% of Amazon. It worked out well. So what, 50,000? <laughs> 
<laughs> that fifty thousand, if they had it now, can it's you do worth the math? ten. It's worth tens of billions of dollars. And did you? No, not the fifty thousand. The the whole million is worth tens of billions. So I don't know how many. And your parents did it as an investment. Yeah, it worked out really well for them. Yes. They 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 invested uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars at an even slightly better valuation, and and uh, could not have happened to better people. Yes. <laughs> Last question. That's for sure, by the way. Couldn't have happened to better people. Last question. Hello, Jeff. My name is Dr. Anita Gupta. I'm from Drexel University. I am a physician, uh, and I feel that the technology that you have put out, Echo, could really change the lives of so many people, not just in improving their life, but perhaps improving their health, and yeah. particularly at a time where healthcare is not doing very well. Do you have a vision of using Echo machine learning, artificial intelligence in healthcare, and if so, what is that vision you have? No, we don't, we, first of all, I totally agree with you. And I think healthcare is gonna be one of those uh, industries that is elevated and made better by machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I actually think Echo and Alexa do have a role to play in that. And we do have people at Amazon thinking about that. But it would be going too far to say that we have worked out a vision. Um, but we are, we're, we're working on having a vision in that arena because I do think it would be very helpful. And it can be helpful in a lot of ways, including in the home, for things like you know, uh, medication compliance and things like that. There, and there are a lot of opportunities. And build on that platform. So in some Absolutely. ways, you'll create that, an there, industry to and, do and that. And there will be, this is, that, this is the only way it's gonna work. Is it, you, you, the medical care system is so big it's not, no one company can do this. It's gonna, it has to be that you provide tools and then you know, hospitals and, uh, and doctors and nurses and so on use those tools to improve healthcare. Insurance companies, and self-funded employers, et cetera, et cetera. Number one on the Vanity Fair <laughs> establishment list. Now we know why. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>